process approach, to the learning outcome approach, to the approach uh, where competences and skills are important and not only knowledge. So uh, we can't do it with one step. And there are a lot of barriers and a lot of difficulties. And that's the reason, actually, why we would have this reflective report and why you have exercises, especially in the group uh, with uh, Eva and Anita, how to contextualize your experience in, for your organization. So uh, in the first, I think it's a little bit, it's not easy if you have, we are, by the way, we are very surprised that we were so creative and so many new ideas. And, and you saw it wasn't easy for us, uh, our, for ourselves, because there was some mixture. Sometimes we couldn't say, well, it could be non-formal, it could be informal, depending. Yeah. So there is some fluency about these different uh, situations. So when we come back now to the formal system, that's the system we are used, because we live in this system and we, adapt, we, we, we use the system. And in a little bit, in a, in a way, it's a little bit more complicated now to think, how can we find ways around to change the system? Uh, we have uh, different kind of levels, we have different stakeholders, and I would like to show you how could we do it with the approach of learning outcomes. So what I'm going to do now is, in my presentation, I will give you four uh, aspects, um, and these aspects they have some importance. More important from the first, second one, the third one is uh, if you are working uh, on kind of curricular development or IT or in uh, some kind uh, to apply this educational designs. And the fourth one is if you're a teacher and uh, want to address this issue, but we thought also other people could use them. For instance, in the public relations department, yeah, you could think about it because if in the, in the future, the people will judge university not only about the content they transmit to the students, but to the skills the students will have if they finish uh, their studies. So it's a little bit now thinking on the, on the reverse side. So uh, this, the first point is what are learning outcomes? Why are they so important? It's important to show and to demonstrate your skills. And this is also very important for the assessment as well. So learning outcomes uh, are focused now on the student-centered approach. And this is one of my main aspects in the talk. I will talk about the differences on these different kind of approaches and how we uh, could well, change this. Uh, the working definition for learning outcomes, we will do this in the next two days. Uh, with real exercises. Yeah? Learning outcomes are just statements, written phrases, phrases yeah? and uh, what you uh, expect uh, a learner to know, to understand, better to demonstrate the skills. We will go a lot in details because if you can formulate and if you can judge learning outcomes, it will change your point of view on the, on, on the assessment, uh, on the teacher's skills, uh, on, on everything. So, but keep in mind that's the back side. We're coming from behind now, yeah? uh, addressing uh, to, uh, the idea of the three talks. John talked on the general level. He gave us the international uh, overview, yeah? but always picked with his experiences in his university. And it's important to know that this is an outstanding example. Our university as well is a university for further education, continuing education. And all what, what, what Jen said is uh, appropriate for our universities, except the idea, that the genius idea, that we will individualize the studies for the students. So what we are doing, uh, as every university is, uh, is doing, we take their competences and see if they fit to our studies. We don't know, we don't, we, we haven't this procedure 
to build up new kinds of studies to fit the competences of the students yeah, and to bring it on the academic level. So the important thing, uh, what uh, John said, is that there are these two procedures, but mainly I'm talking now uh, about the main procedure, the procedure that is normally now done in, at universities and most of the universities. So what we're thinking now is how can we do kind of uh, curricula with learning outcomes, but the idea is the learning outcomes are broader. They are not only this knowledge and this knowledge, vector knowledge, they are broader to fit in this lifelong learning system and to have a kind of a way to change the system as a whole. So uh, when we describe the qualification, then we would have different kinds of uh, concepts. We would have this kind of workload that's very important. We are calculating the workload of a student in hours, in learning hours. I learned this from John, the, the, the English word is notational hours, notational learning hours. It's not the physical learning time in, in the case that you have, let's say, uh, you get a certificate after six weeks, but it's the time you have spent on this issue really learning. Yeah? That means reading, yeah? uh, looking at the internet, comparing something, discussing something, to go into the seminar, uh, to sitting here and uh, ours, yes, but you also had your preparation, and your preparation is also kind of learning uh, ours. So let me come now to the learning theory, and this is important for the uh, approach to change uh, to the uh, student-centered approach. I'm now in the transfer mode, meaning I had a I have a concept, and I want to transmit some kind of knowledge to you. And you see, that's more, uh, I have uh, two of these teachers here, yeah? the teacher in front here, yeah? kind of an authority. I'm speaking, you're listening here. Yeah? Listening is an active uh, enterprise, but not so active as talking and discussing here. Yeah? So, and normally uh, I say, this is correct and this is wrong, yeah? So I'm really the person who says uh, what is correct. The second one, I call it learning two, uh, is uh, I show you something. Uh, let's say I, I will bring up the water example uh, in scuba diving to give you some ideas. I show you something, I demonstrate you something, and I watch you, I observe you what you are doing. But in swimming, for instance, I do not swim with you. I just stand behind you and I say, okay, your arms aren't correct, you have to, <gasps> you have to freeze, yeah? Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm watching you, yeah? But it's the difference, I'm with you with the knee in the water, yeah? <laughs> not outside in the pool, yeah, as in the first. And the, sec and the third one, that's a real situation where we work collaboratively on a subject, on a problem, yeah, solving some task. And the third one is a little bit dangerous in the teacher's perspective because it, it can fail. We, when we do a project, there are so many perspectives and so many circumstances, we can't control everything. It's the financial situation, it's the time budget, some, somebody goes, goes, when is ill yeah, and missing something or, or whatever happens. Yeah. We haven't the control, but that's the real life situation. Yeah? So what we are doing normally in teaching one and even in teaching two, we describe problems to our students, but problems we know uh, the solution and how it goes to solve it. So it's a, like a didactical reduction of, this, of the problem. Yeah? We have a lot of data, but we don't present these data to students because they aren't relevant for the problem. But in real life, you have to sort out yourself which data is necessary and which not. So we, uh, let's say, we educate you as a problem solver, but we construct a problem by the teacher, and we do not educate as a problem generator where has new ideas and says, I have to change this and that. But it's important to know, uh, especially in my profession, educationalists, 
all of them want to be on the constructivist side and want to be coach. And uh, I'm not agree with them because uh, I bring always the example of scuba diving. I learned scuba diving with bottle water yeah, uh, in Mexico. And I was so happy that we didn't start to go underwater 10 meters immediately. Uh, he explained us everything uh, outside. Then we used the swimming pool yeah, and we, make some, we, we did some exercises. And after that, we really went under the sea with, uh, under 10 meter and went, make, make, uh, made the assessments. Yeah? So what I believe is, is a kind of a development of a different kind of uh, um, knowledge career you have uh, to uh, go. But uh, now uh, let's talk about knowledge and skills. <laughs> There's a big difference about them. We have a differ we different differentiate uh, knowledge in three ways. There is some kind of a static knowledge. And normally, especially in my profession, when I was uh, educated as a teacher, or in my school time, uh, it was very important. We had to learn a lot of things. Yeah? For instance, Soviet Union, yeah, Soviet Union, and all this kind of stuff. But it changes so much. Yeah? For instance, we learned at that time Austria has 7 million people, but now it has 8.5 million. Yeah? And this kind of knowledge, yeah? actually, it was overloading us. We had to learn and we had to repeat it. But this knowledge you can look up in the internet or in other areas where it is adaptive and where it is in uh, 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 real time uh, it is, it is changed so that it is correct. So what we would need is uh, to reduce this kind of declarative knowledge because it's a very constrained knowledge, uh, it changes much and it overloads us with not, in, with not so useful things. And then we would have this kind of procedural knowledge. And all the people say, oh, procedural knowledge, that is important. Then we would have how to do it. Yeah? But keep in mind that procedural knowledge, how to do something that's more on a holistic point of view, for instance, how to make a public phone call. I have to know that I have to take the receiver well, well, now, that's an outdated example that <laughs> everybody has, but let me explain. You have to take the receiver and then to put the coin in it, yeah? otherwise it wouldn't work. So we have some kind of sequences, yeah? but very important, uh, procedural knowledge is still a theoretical knowledge. For instance, I know how to change a spare tire from the car, yeah? but well, I can't do it because I have two left hands. Yeah, well, I'm not in the. But this, it has to do with my body, with my conception of the mind, uh, and it's, it, it isn't enough just to know it. Yeah. So we have this problem also to do it. Yeah. It's difficult with with cognitive things because we think well, that's the same. But also our our brain is a kind of a tool of an instrument. And uh, if you learn, for instance, formulas in mathematics, it's different to apply them. Yeah? So you have to, it's, it's a big difference. Uh, and the third one uh, I, I, I did here is knowing where we need uh, now, nowadays a lot of kind of social knowledge because you, you, it's necessary to know where uh, are made the decision, for instance, in the organization. Where I get the information. Yeah? Uh, and also for what for I, I'm doing this. So this kind of social knowledge is uh, growing in importance. And you understand, social knowledge is difficult to teach. No? We're coming now in an area where some kind of tacit knowledge or informal knowledge yeah, is necessary. But on the other hand, we have these competences, abilities, skills, and there is really a gap. You can't go from one side to the other side just by co cognizing it, <coughs> just by thinking something, just by remembering or yeah, uh, thrill you something. Yeah? You have to do it. You have to do some practice. And this is important now that we, in our society, we value the left part much more than the right part. You say, okay, 
Okay. Educated here, and then you have your own experiences when you are on your own. Yeah, a little bit further education. Okay, come in, and we will show you. Yeah, but your experiences we do not support your experiences. Sometimes you are in a narrow field, you don't get all the experiences. Yeah, you you have the contact to other peoples, and you can't exchange your experiences. It has a little bit changed now with the internet because people, there are a lot of portals where people exchange their experiences without, sorry, I have to say, without academic knowledge. Yeah? <laughs> they just say it, how to do it, yeah? and it works. So some people believe that even this kind of knowledge arises from the practice knowledge. So when we go in this world with our body and we uh, talk to other people or we uh, work, then we get some knowledge, we acquire something. Yeah? And this something we could also put in academic terms. But people believe without experiences there is no knowledge at all. So that's the other side of the point of, of argument. And uh, this is an idea by Hubert Dreyfus. He is a philosopher, I was there in Berkeley uh, and worked with him. Um, and he said there are different levels of expertise. And the first one is more to remember, we need this uh, information processing. The second one is about this know-how, is a beginner. For instance, uh, when I want to drive a car, you have to explain me about the driver. And, but then I have to do it. But the beginner has no much experience. He's very rough and he has to think about it and he's slow, yeah? he makes a lot of mistakes, even knows, even doesn't know that this is a mistake. The third one is normally the level we say now your competence is enough, you can go outside and you can go for work. We call it competence, but I call it here skill one. It's a kind of a competence, you can solve this problem, but something in like in the Hamlet way, yeah? You have to think about it, you have uh, to reflect about it. It's not done at the fingertips. It's not very, like an expert. Yeah? And this is the reason uh, Hubert Dreyfus wor worked against this artificial intelligence uh, idea that everybody uh, could, uh, every computer could be an expert just with rules, yeah? And then he came up with the force, he called it uh, implicit uh, knowledge. It's uh, to understand it much better, to have uh, the, uh, the, the idea uh, fluently. And the last one, the expert, he called it the expert, uh, are persons who have patterns in, the, in mind. We think about more than 100,000 patterns in your mind. Think about it, 100,000 patterns, because you build up this kind of patterns, uh, some kind of configurations, uh, and you match the real situation immediately. So a good manager, or let's say a soccer player, yeah, he soccer player doesn't stand and say, okay, the, here's the goalkeeper, here's the door, so okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does it, and when you ask him why, he, uh, yeah, he meet the goal and all are happy. Uh, sometimes he says, yes, okay, I saw that something, but that's not true. Yeah? He had some kind of a feeling, intuitive feeling. He can, he, later he can, he can express it in words, but it was some kind of an experience of a pattern he did. Um, there is a lot of uh, experiments going on, especially with check playing. Yeah? Because they tried to build up artificial intelligence systems, they are better check players than humans. Yeah? As you know, they are now. Yeah? At that time, they had big problems. Yeah? But the idea was uh, to make, uh, uh, to give you the idea and, and to more in the, go in detail, just this example. They had a video camera and uh, they had a uh, a player and they said, okay, please move and tell us what you are thinking. And they thought if they know what they are thinking, in the end they can build artificial intelligence systems. And it started well, the, the, the check players uh, told every move, but in the middle of the check game, he didn't 
talk anything, just moved. But with the video camera, everybody saw that a lot of eye movement were going on. And then they talked to them, yeah, what, what did you think? And that was very disappointing for the researcher, because the tech player said, well, well, I had a similar situation, yeah, and I thought if I'm going with this uh, king, uh, with this uh, queen here, then I would force uh, this situation. He couldn't explain it. Yeah? So it had, had in mind a similar situation and tried to uh, <coughs> copy the similar situation. So uh, it was the idea that there are patterns in our mind we can't express quite well, and we can't. A pattern is a holistic thing. You can't uh, explain it uh, with all all these kind of things. So what are now coming back to the learning outcomes? Um, we have the problem that we have to assess this different kind of knowledge, and people came up with a kind of a taxonomy. This is a very famous one. Is the well well known? I think. Maybe some of you already know the Bloom taxonomy. It's way back from, from the 50s. Uh, it's still uh, a black a, a table. People use it. But you can see, interesting enough, we have substantives here. No verbs, no do it. Yeah? Are concepts here. And uh, pupils of Bloom made a different taxonomy starting with 2001, a pretty new one, and they put it in a, a two-dimensional table. Here uh, on, 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 on the x-axis you see, uh, but they are verbs now, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. You, you see, remember, uh, the level one, yeah? and create, we had this constructivist level, and then they decided about facts, concepts, procedures, and also metacognitive level, meaning the level how to learn, how to judge your own uh, activity. And this uh, 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 taxonomy we will use also for the learning outcomes, because it's a nice uh, tool with this two-dimensional uh, table. I have here a comparison. They are pretty similar, except of uh, step five to six, then there is some difference. Uh, and uh, one point is very important. In the Bloom taxonomy, knowledge, factual knowledge, has a much more importance than it has in the other, in, in the other taxonomy. OK. Now, next. Is it, is it, is it important to understand that the higher level of competencies include the lower level. Meaning, if you analyze something, you should also understand the thing. Because otherwise you could analyze it. Yeah? Yeah, that's not so, not so trivial. Yeah? But you see, if you judge it, you need to analyze it. Yeah? And you need all the other skills below. So that's kind, we call it inclusive hierarchy. Uh, you have included it uh, in the, the smaller one, in the included one, like you call it the Russian Matroshka? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, it's like this, yeah? <laughs> inside, inside, and okay. So that's just coming back. Uh, this is the idea that we have this kind of different uh, um, learning styles uh, in the taxonomy. We can say the, the fit in the taxonomy, but keep in mind, Everything is necessary, not just the coach approach. And these are, I tried to match it with the concept of the EU. The first one uh, was a paper by me and uh, Sabine Bayer. And this one, uh, well, they haven't it matched with the taxonomy. Yeah, that was my work. But it perfectly fit, fits to this taxonomy. I think that's important that we have some new finding in the research work but also compliance uh, with the uh, terms and procedures. They are mainstreams and done by the European Union. This is a little bit uh, what uh, Eva told us about the qualification framework. So this um, is now to give you the idea about this circle. Actually, it's not a circle. 
uh, it's kind of, it's a kind of spiral. It's the right word, spiral. It's spiral. 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 Yeah. It's going up. No, it's not on the place. Yeah, it's going up. And what it needs is some kind of interaction with the object that is normally you are doing in technical terms. You work on something and you work with the object. But we also need uh, to discuss it and to reflect it and then to interact it, to implement it in the society. Every technical innovation needs a kind of a social innovation as well because we have to adapt it to the society, to the market. Yeah? Uh, uh, we have to see what is the competition and where can we win and so on. So this is kind of uh, a summary. And now let us go more in detail about the methodology. Now we're going back and we really want to think how can we do now, all, how can we uh, take all this knowledge that we have about these different kind of learning styles and uh, these different kind uh, of teaching uh, modes, how, how, uh, how can we do that uh, and to put it in guidelines for education and curriculum design? The first one is clearly define the learning outcomes. Normally, that's not so easy. I have to confess, even in our university, I'm a member of the curriculum commission, and the change from input area to the learning outcome is pretty, pretty difficult because professors are used to say what they want to teach. They aren't used to say what students should, not, should have skill afterwards. Yeah? And they say, well, there's this book and it's important that students should know. Yeah? They don't think about, they are more input driven. Yeah? I'm the professor and I know what to do and I will say them that. Yes, yeah? But to define the learning outcomes, they have to put it on the other side. They have to think in the end, what should the students know? And as a matter of fact, it's a little bit also sad for teachers because if it's important what you know, then it is not so important if you know it by my teaching or by your reading or by your doing. In a little bit, of, as, a, as, a, as a matter of fact, yeah, if the outcome matters, the input, the way of input and how to ex get to this knowledge, it's not so important anymore. So in a, in a certain respect, it's also, and maybe that's one of the reasons why we have problems that we can change, yeah? Because uh, uh, if you have this knowledge already, why you should get in this course and to make it an, a, another examination of a knowledge you, maybe you know better than the teacher because you have done it 30 years. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about this kind of uh, hierarchy. There's another inclusive hierarchy. But now you can see that we have different educational levels. This is important for adapting the learning outcomes to your university because we have different levels and you have to think about it on what level you would like to implement the learning outcomes. In the first three levels, there are no learning outcomes at all because learning outcomes start with the module approach because in the modularized phase uh, curricula, you have to put learning outcomes and you have to assess all the knowledge in the module. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, it's a problem because uh, we didn't think about that, that there is a lot of examination uh, to be done. At first, we thought, okay, there's uh, some kind of similarity. And if we think on a uh, Lego, yeah, put together these pieces, then it would be very nice to have small pieces so they could fit together in a better way. But if you have small pieces, then you have to have learning outcomes and assessment of all the small pieces. In the end, you have a curriculum full of, of examinations. So now we're on the way to make bigger, bigger modules. We started, let's say, with two, two ECTS or three ECTS. Yeah? Now we're going more to six or to 10 ECTS. Um, uh, in, I think in our country there, there are different uh, uh, powers per ECTS. In, in my country it's 25, I think in yours it's 32, as, as I uh, remember, Nadia told me. So uh, it's a little bit harder in your country yeah, to get the, the, the ECTS. Uh, 
years. Um, and then you have to think about the module and then uh, also the curriculum. Uh, they should fit with the module. So you need also to write learning outcomes for the program. Yeah? That's maybe important now for the public relations thing because these are the learning outcomes you put outside. If a student comes to your university and takes uh, this study such and such, then it should have these kind of skills and these skills are important for the market, for the employers. Yeah? So if you put here uh, the, the skills uh, after the program is done. You have also your institutional. In the institution you define uh, what kind of learning outcomes, how you divide it here, yeah? are you small have your small learning outcomes, what kind of culture you would have. And then we have this legalization issue. Uh, yesterday Nadia talked about it, I'm not sure if you have heard it. Uh, and she uh, showed us uh, I think it was three lights full of Russian regulations uh, to put in place this kind of new system piece by piece. Yeah, and it's pretty complicated because it's done piece by piece and not all, not always uh, uh, coordinated. But the legislation is important. Uh, for instance, uh, in Austria we have a discussion if it's more important that the teacher is in class and it's all, he, he just gets paid for uh, teaching in the classroom. And that's a problem because the teacher is preparing, uh, he's assessing or she's assessing, yeah? and it's not only in the classroom anymore, yeah? it's your learning. Your learning and your learning is not only in the classroom. So we have to change the relation. We have to say, for instance, if you, let's say, yeah, if you're in an online course, yeah, I'm doing my answering and my feedback at home, yeah, not in the classroom. And you judge it by the quality, but also by the responsive time. Yeah? It, I, I can't say if you are in an online course, okay, next week we have the next hour for our seminar, I will answer it. Yeah? So it doesn't make sense. Uh, so we need different kind of, of quality assurance yeah? and different aspects, and this is uh, regulated in the educational system. What I wanted to say is here that you have to find your place here. We are kind of uh, working in one of these areas. Uh, we have to serve the higher levels, but with our work, we can also a little bit change, put pressure on the higher level that it can, that it can change. And in all these different levels, you have different laws of changes. So it, you have different uh, access modes. And now, coming back to curriculum, uh, we have some kind of global objectives. Uh, it's more or less providing a vision, but really, what's really uh, important is, I call it educational objectives. Uh, these are designing the curriculum, the module. That you will say, uh, when you have, let's say, 70, for instance, our training here. We have 64 hours of learning time. We yeah. have three days face-to-face uh, -face time, yeah. meaning 30 hours. We have, I uh, can't remember exactly, we explained it in the website, 15 hours preparation time and 15, uh, 15 hours for your preparation for the assessment. All in all, 72 hours and you get two credit points <coughs> through the ETPS. So that's the way now we think. And we also formulated, remember, uh, Isabel, when we started, she explained to you the learning objective and the learning outcomes. Uh, participants after the seminar, remember, yeah? and this is this, uh, how to come the slogan, yeah? uh, the students will, and after that we have some, put some uh, work in it, some work, but not only work, work, yeah? and it should be a work you can assess. So it's difficult uh, to say students will understand. How can you assess understanding? Okay, but the next one we call alignment. The next one is selective foreign teaching control. Because if I say you should be able, let's say a uh, very simple example, how to call it, John Lear? Uh, Juggling. Juggling. Juggling, yeah. Okay, I want uh, after the seminar that you can juggle with four balls, okay? It, 
So it doesn't have many sense if I'm standing here and I will explain you how you have to put in the ball and so it, 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 it doesn't help either if I would demonstrate it to you. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, I have to think about it some practices yeah? and then in the end you should demonstrate it when we have an examination. Yeah? And in this examination it wouldn't be a multiple choice test, right? Because it doesn't make sense. Yeah? You have to demonstrate it because you have to show it. Yeah? So we have to uh, address the teaching methods and also the assessment methods to the learning objective. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. I, I made this joke, but please keep in mind it's done always this way. We have very high skills. We say students should communicate and should be processed or should be analyzed or something. And then we put them in a, a multiple choice test, and we know that the multiple choice test is focused on remembering, and it's very low. So this is also, as a matter of fact, uh, if you're really uh, serious with learning outcomes, you have to change your teaching methods, but more than that, your assessment methods. Where all our assess assessment methods are more or less written or verbally. And if we want to test skills, we need other kind of, of assessments. Okay, uh, we ha will have this exercise with you in the next few days. We have different kind uh, of uh, cognitive processes. And this would be an example of a learning objective. Students are able, if we start every sentence with this, students are able to. And then say some verb, uh, apply this. Case, apply the concept of learning outcomes to their curriculum. Okay, so that this will be done our exercise in the next two days, so that you can formalize uh, learning outcomes and also think about it, how to assess it, and uh, how what kind of teaching method to take. Uh, I, I give you here an example. I've done. Uh, I'm now the responsible person for the national education report in media. Development and uh, we looked at the curriculum in Austria, um, Isabel did it, yeah, and they formulated, they reorganized it now with learning outcomes, yeah, and they were very proud of it because it was the first time they did all this kind of learning outcomes very systematically. But it turned out that, that the learning outcomes are much too uh, small, they had, I think, 75 learning outcomes. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, no, yeah, but the yeah, an expert is laughing, but yeah. yeah. And uh, so they are too much fine grained, uh, yeah. And when you see, we tried to analyze it uh, in, the, in the taxonomy, you can't see much in analyze and evaluate, yeah. You see some in create, yeah, but uh, this is on media design, so it means uh, you can set up a WordPress web blog, yeah. It's not creative in the sense, uh, so you are doing some technical skills here, yeah? but at least you have some here. Yeah? Most of them are in procedures to apply them. Yeah? And I think this gives a little bit of an evaluation sheet. Yeah? Uh, it, it's, it's poor done in analyze and evaluation. So I'll come now um, to the assessment, the last one. Um, I have here the two different perspectives. We have the teacher's perspective, that was the uh, old one. I have my objectives, I put it in some kind of uh, teaching uh, hours, and then <coughs> we have teaching activities, and in the end there is the assessment. But now it's the other way around. I have to think about the assessment, how to prove the skills, and what kind of teaching methods and how to do it. So it's the other way around. But here you will see um, most of the type of assessment is still done uh, on a very traditional way. We have uh, most of our teaching, even if it's very, let's say, innovative teaching, is done by lecturing, by the way. Uh, different. This is also the reason why we have big problems uh, with burnouts by teachers, because uh, the teacher not only want to lecture, want to address questions, yeah? 
uh, but lecturing. So he wants to be in control. And it's very demanding yeah, to be in control if people want to ask or want to discuss something. Yeah? Uh, and it's not very, uh, at least in my country, it's, there are, let's say, a certain strength, they are very suspective about working groups. If people are in working groups, for instance, if you are um, teaching, as me now, you get more pay for the hour if you are addressing and organizing working groups because they, they believe that you are doing nothing <laughs> in that case. Yeah. It's another, another prize. Yeah. So uh, it's very strange because normally it's much more demanding to organize working groups and to get to the result and to help them and uh, to change from one group to the other one and so on. Yeah, uh, we have uh, in uh, Austria at least some kind of hierarchy, this kind of uh, competences that's not so important for you. I want to go a little bit faster. I want to address your grading system because the grading system also is uh, very important. Um, here, this, maybe this is also a nice, a, a, a nice slide, maybe the next one is the better one. Uh, you can see here the alignment of the different kind of assessment methods to the taxonomy. Yeah? Multiple choice you see is on remember and maybe a little bit understanding, a little bit. Yeah? But uh, our reflective report would be more on apply, analyze, evaluate side. We could also make a project, we don't have the time, projects are very time consuming. Yeah? Uh, it, we have this essay, here this essay, yeah? and clearly enough, uh, there are other uh, um, possibilities as well. Uh, the oral examination. Uh, and, 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 uh, unfortunately, I think the colleague from the medicine is gone. Yeah? Another the, is there. Uh, oh, Another yeah. surgery. The, the, but uh, I, I was advisor from the uh, medical universities. And they told me that they have uh, demonstration cases. They have uh, when they have assessments. Yeah, people have to come in and have to do something, and they are watched. And there are, yeah? for instance, washing hand. You know? It's not so easy. Uh, so very, very. You, know, you have to do it several times, and there is some kind of procedure under the elbow and so on. Yeah, or they have to put the vaccine or something else. Uh, so that's, uh, in my, my, my point of view, um, that's more on the skill side and we should think in other academic spheres as well. How could we judge and how could we set up procedures where we have more uh, assessment on the skill side. Okay, here we have a checklist uh, about the knowledge, but this is also done in our uh, working groups. And now to the last one, how to assess these learning outcomes and how to match it uh, with the, let's say, what, what, is, what was intended. And this is a little bit difficult because we have different kinds of grading systems, different kinds of uh, how to judge the assessment. Uh, sometimes in pedagogical issue we have uh, some kind of assessment, well, uh, you didn't meet the criteria of the course, but you started very poor. Yeah? Uh, and finally, well, you get a higher level, it was fine. For you, yeah, you didn't meet the criteria of the course, but you made some advances. Yeah? Well, this isn't allowed, no? because you have the learning outcomes and you have to meet the learning outcomes. Yeah? There was some individual progress, but in the end, uh, you didn't meet it. This is most of the people are not using them, but it makes sense in other cases, uh, especially in informal learning, non-formal learning, but also, let's say, for kids or if you don't have grades. The next one is the social benchmark. It's a tricky one. For instance, if I have a course, and maybe, yes, let's let assume now our, our seminar, yeah? Imagine yeah, that we have this final test and nobody passes. <laughs> then we would have a problem, okay? <laughs> yeah? Or let's say some very few people pass it, yeah? And then 
you think about it, yeah, and then you go against the, uh, you look again into the essays, and you say, well, but actually this isn't so bad, right? <laughs> We could put a better note, so we could put forward this one and that one, and we are driving for a so-called Gauss curve, yeah? So that we have a, a very few, very excellent, yeah? And very few poor, poor is necessary, you know? So that people can't pass to say that it's a really strong test. <laughs> there are some people who didn't pass it. <laughs> yeah? This is the social benchmark, yeah? Actually, from the standpoint of a learning outcomes, it's not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but you see there is some kind of difficulty. Yeah? Uh, the, the, the third one is the learning objective benchmark. We define in, before what kind of uh, uh, skills you need, and we assess them and we break them. This is the Austrian one. Uh, here I have the, the Russian one. This is just an example. Here you have uh, the learning outcome. You will get all the, the, the slides here. Yeah. Here you have the learning outcomes. And then, you, but this is uh, on the other way around, because in, in Austria the, the, the worst grade is, 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 is five. Mm -hmm. We have it the other way around. Yeah? I'm a little bit nervous if people are just talking about disadvantages or just talking about advantages. So I put also forward some disadvantages of learning outcomes. One of them is that learning outcomes are very concrete and they are very to the point and people believe that the academic system should be open, should be wider, should be free. We call it in Europe kind of a humanistic education. Yeah? Uh, so some people believe that learning outcomes is a reduction yeah, to some kind of knowledge. Uh, the second one I have already mentioned with my uh, joke is that we would have an assessment-driven curriculum. Yeah, uh, we would uh, see, uh, uh, we would teach him to the test. We know what the test is. Yeah, PISA test and so on. Yeah. Now we have this big discussion in Austria because we are now changing our uh, system, uh, and the people know what the what the what the test will be. And then they teach just to the test, nothing else. This kills some creativity, kills some individualism. Yeah. And the third one is um, that it's not easy to implement the learning outcomes if it isn't fully implemented. Because it's a system change. You can't have learning outcomes in one seminar and not in the other, or not in the curriculum, or not at the university. So this is difficult, you can't do it piece by piece. It's more or less a framework, a framework for the whole uh, curriculum and university. But two pages now, two slides of advantages. Yeah? <laughs> One is help the teachers to tell students more precisely uh, what at the end they have, for, uh, what skills they have. Um, help teachers to design the materials. Because uh, when I know you, have, would have, you should have these kind of skills, I should look on my material if it's uh, fulfilled is clear. Yeah? So um, another one is uh, to calculate. Students have to calculate the learning time and they have to observe the learning time. They have to know how many hours. For instance, my first seminar, I had the problem that uh, with, I'm teaching e-education and we had a kind of a forum where people present ideas to each other and then we had the material and then the test uh, and in the material they had to do some activities and some people put a lot of effort in the forum yeah, uh, just for three ATS, 75 hours and they had 50 hours in the forum yeah? and then they get the task they really had to do and they were very uh, disappointed because they didn't read that they just has 25 hours for the forum. So students now have to observe their learning style and you can help them because you say them what is assumed. It's always a, let's say, a calculation on the sum. Yeah? There are students, they are more experienced, they don't need so much time and other they need more time. But on the general, it should uh, fit. 
And the second slide will say that uh, we have different kind of assessment now. We will differentiate the assessments. Uh, and also, if we would have learning outcomes, we could communicate better what we are doing in our teaching. Yeah? Because we can say, when in my teaching, students have the ability to do that and that. Yeah, and the last one is uh, to ensure the appropriate teaching and assessment strategies. Uh, by the way, that's one we are a little bit missing. As a professor, well, it's for me important the content, yeah? and in the end there is this final exam, and, the, and sometimes this is a commission, it's not only me. Yeah? So, but now, nowadays, you have to think about the assessments as well. Okay, so thank you much and now